Welcome to my second video on antibacterial drugs. In this video, I'll go over the modes of actions in which antibacterial drugs perform in order to prevent bacterial growth or kill bacterial cells. So I'll go through these modes of actions very quickly and then I'll go into them to more detail so that you can understand the action that is performed by these drugs in order to prevent or kill bacterial cells. So let's begin with the synthesis of peptidoglycan. This first mode of action will prevent the formation of a rigid peptidoglycan layer that's present in all bacterial cells. As you'll see, these drugs will have different targets, and thus they will interfere at different steps along the process of this peptidoglycan layer. The second mode of action will be to disrupt the cell membrane, which then will allow extracellular fluid to enter the cell and the cytoplasm to escape the cell. Now these drugs will insert themselves within the bacterial cell membrane and disrupt its integrity, thus causing osmotic lysis. The third mode of action will be to inhibit a key metabolic pathway that's unique to bacteria. An example that we often use is the metabolic pathway that produces folic acid. These antibacterial drugs act as an enzyme substrate and bind to the enzymes and stop the pathway in its tracks. The fourth mode of action will be to inhibit or prevent protein synthesis. If proteins can't be made, the cell stops metabolizing and stops growing. The fifth mode of action is to prevent RNA synthesis by binding to RNA polymerase. And the last mode of action is to bind to DNA gyrase, thus preventing DNA replication. Next, I'll show you the specific antibacterial drug classes and their specific targets in more detail. I'll begin with the antibacterial drugs that prevent the synthesis of peptidoglycan component of the cell wall. This group of antibacterial drugs contain the classes of polypeptides, beta-lactams, and glycopeptide drugs. In order for you to understand how these classes prevent peptidoglycan synthesis, I'll include a review on how peptidoglycan is made. So remember that peptidoglycan will consist of a long strands of polysaccharides made of repeated NAM, which stands for N-acetylmuramic acid, and NAG, which represents N-acetylglucosamine. These are both monosaccharides. In addition, NAM has a peptide attached to it in the length of five amino acids. This is called a pentapeptide. The five circles attached to NAM on the left represent the five amino acids shown here on the right. These peptidoglycan monomers are made inside the bacterial cell inside the cytoplasm. As soon as NAM is made, it binds to a molecule of UDP, uracil diphosphate, which in turn will link to a transmembrane carrier molecule called bactoprenol. Notice that bactoprenol brought with it one phosphate group, and it gained a second one when it bound to NAM. This will be very important when we discuss vasotracin effect on peptidoglycan synthesis. Once bactoprenol is joined to NAM, it will bind to NAM, freeing UDP from NAG. And bactoprenol now transports the peptidoglycan disaccharide subunit across the cell membrane to the exterior of the cell. Now, as NAG and NAM disaccharide are released from bactoprenol, Bactoprenol re-enters the cell and is dephosphorylated with the help of the enzyme phosphatase. Now that bactoprenol has one phosphate group, it is able to link to the next UDP NAM. If bactoprenol does not lose the phosphate group, it will not be able to bind to the next UDP NAM molecule and peptidoglycan synthesis will stop at this stage.
So this is how bacitracin inhibits peptidoglycan synthesis. By preventing phosphatase from dephosphorylating bactoprenol. So in the absence of bacitracin, peptidoglycan synthesis does continue. All the newly exported NAM and NAG disaccharides need to combine covalently to a growing polypeptide chain that's being formed outside the cell. The NAM and NAG subunits that have been just exported outside the cell are going to be joined to the growing polypeptide chain with the help of transmembrane proteins called penicillin binding proteins. These are transmembrane proteins that are embedded within the cell membrane and have multiple enzyme functions. Penicillin binding proteins or PBPs were first discovered for their ability to bind to penicillin, but they have two very important enzyme functions and one of them is called glycosyl transferase. Penicillin binding proteins with glycosyl transferase activity will form a long polysaccharide chain by linking the NAG and NOM disaccharides together. Penicillin binding proteins have a second enzyme function called transpeptidase. These penicillin binding proteins will join the long polysaccharide strands together to form a rigid carbohydrate layer. If I associate a long polysaccharide chain of peptidoglycan to that of a chain that has many links to it, if I have a series of chains side by side, just like a series of peptidoglycan polysaccharides, I can easily move them, and this would not make for a rigid cell wall. So instead, I'd like to cross-link them, and that would prevent the, the chains from moving away from each other, similar to the idea of a a chain mail that a knight in shining armor would wear. This adds for extra protection. This is the basis of a rigid peptidoglycan cell wall. So only when the polysaccharide chains are interconnected will the peptidoglycan be strong enough to prevent the cell from dying through osmolysis. These penicillin binding proteins will bind to the pentapeptides of the NOM subunit and they will remove the terminal D-alanine amino acid from that pentapeptide. Next, they'll link the two peptides from the adjoining peptidoglycan strands. The overall result is to covalently link the many strands of peptidoglycans together, strengthening the peptidoglycan layer in the process. Now the beta-lactam and glycopeptides in this group will prevent this transpeptidase activity. It will prevent the joining of the polysaccharide strands, but they do this by binding to two different targets. So let's first look at the beta-lactams. The beta-lactams are going to be presented here in pink. They compete with the NOMS2 alanines by binding to the penicillin binding proteins transpeptidase active site. The two alanines act as a substrate to penicillin binding proteins, and if the beta-lactam drug covers the active site, then the terminal alanine will not be removed from the peptidoglycan strand, and the long strands of peptidoglycan are not linked together, leaving the cell wall weakened. There are four subclasses of beta-lactams. You have the cephalosporins, the penicillins, the monobactams, and the carbipenems. Each subclass has a different chemical structure, but they all have a beta-lactam ring, shown here in the orange squares. Each member within these subclasses interact with the penicillin binding proteins transpeptidase active site through their beta-lactam rings. If their rings are destroyed or change in any way, the drug will no longer bind to penicillin binding proteins and is thus inactive. So in summary, if you know the function of one of these subclass members, such as penicillin, you basically know the function of all the other drugs shown on this slide. Now, even though they all have functions similar to each other, they tend to affect different bacteria. Some will inhibit peptidoglycan synthesis in certain gram-positive bacteria, while other drugs will only affect gram-negative bacteria and some will have a broad spectrum activity against many gram-positive and gram-negative strains. Now let's take a closer look at the glycopeptides. 
Remember I said that they also prevent transpeptidase activity of the penicillin binding proteins. The difference is in their target. Glycoproteins such as vancomycin or tycoplanin bind to NOMS alanine amino acids instead of the penicillin binding proteins transpeptidase active site. So in other words, they bind to the transpeptidase substrate instead to the enzyme itself. When vancomycin or tycoplanin are attached to the D-alanine D-alanine, the two amino acids can't bind to their penicillin binding proteins active site, which has the same effect as if the beta-lactams bound to the penicillin binding proteins themselves. So they're going to prevent the cross-linking between the peptidoglycan strands. All these drugs are bactericidal. However, they vary in their spectrum. So for example, bacitracin is a good broad spectrum drug. Cephalosporins were originally narrow spectrum, affecting only gram negative bacteria. But chemists modified the chemistry by including gram positives in its spectrum. Penicillins were originally narrow spectrum, only affecting gram positive bacteria, but chemists modified the chemistry to include more gram negative bacteria, making them broad spectrum. The monobactams are narrow spectrum, affecting gram negatives. Carbipenems are broad spectrum, affecting both gram positive and gram negative. And lastly, glycopeptides, they are narrow spectrum. So this covers the first mode of action. Let's move to the second mode of action, and that is the disruption of the cell membrane. This group of antibacterial drugs includes the polymyxins and daptomycin. Let's start with polymyxins. Polymyxins are polypeptides with lipophilic properties. They can insert themselves inside the lipopolysaccharide component of the outer membrane of the gram-negative bacteria thus disrupting the outer membrane layer. Remember, this is the outermost layer of a gram-negative bacterial cell wall. They will then migrate to the cell membrane and repeat the process, killing the bacterial cell. Polymyxins target specifically gram-negative bacteria. They'll have very low selective toxicity, but they can damage the host kidney cells and nerve cells. Thus, the drug is only given topically as an ointment in the form of neosporin. Next is daptomycin. Daptomycin is a lipopeptide that works like polymyxin, inserting itself inside the cell membrane of gram-positive bacteria. The third mode of action is to prevent folic acid metabolism. Now, bacteria need to make folic acid unlike us. We get folic acid from our diet. However, Bacteria cannot take folic acid from their environment. They must make it. Folic acid is important because it's a precursor to making adenine and thymine. These are two nucleic acids that help make up DNA. Thus, DNA synthesis is prevented if the bacteria cannot make its folic acid. In order to understand this, let's go through the folic acid pathway. It's going to be a multi-step pathway. First, paraaminobenzoic acid, also known as PABA, needs to combine with pteridine and L-glutamate to form dihydrofolic acid. Then dihydrofolic acid reacts with NADPH to form tetrahydrofolic acid, which reacts or which acts as a precursor for DNA, RNA, and protein molecules. The antibacterial drug sulfamethoxazole is a member of the sulfonamide drugs that is very similar to PABA. Thus, it can compete with PABA to bind with pteridine. If sulfamethoxazole binds to pteridine, dihydrofolic acid is formed, and the rest of the pathway is stopped. Trimethoprim is another antibacterial drug that inhibits this pathway, but it looks similar to hydrofolic acid, and it will compete for its binding to NADPH. In effect, tetrahydrofolic acid isn't made, 
and sulfonamides and trimethoprim alone will decrease the production of folic acid to a bacteriostatic level, thus inhibiting bacterial growth and are both broad spectrum. But if they're taken together, they can decrease the production of folic acid to the bactericidal level. This is a good example of antibacterial synergy. The next mode of action involves a class of drugs that inhibit ribosome function. Now remember ribosomes help translate messenger RNA information to make proteins. Bacteria need proteins in order to live. Within this class of drugs, some will target either the small or the large subunit of the ribosomes. In each case, this effect will prevent protein synthesis. These drugs tend to be bacteriostatic and prevent bacterial growth without actively killing the bacteria. Just to remind you, the cytoplasmic ribosomes found in eukaryotic cells, such as ours, they are known as the ADS ribosomes. They're going to have similar functions of the ribosomes found in bacteria, the 70S, but structurally different proteins. This will make for inhibition of protein synthesis a very good mode of action to treat bacterial infections. The classes of antibacterial drugs in this group will include the aminoglycosides, tetracyclines, macrolides, and chloramphenicols, to name a few. The aminoglycosides will target the 30th subunit of the 70s ribosomes. That's the small subunit. In effect, they prevent proofreading, which promotes the incorrect placement of amino acids, resulting in mutations at the protein level. Tetracyclines also bind to the 30th subunit, but at a slightly different place, preventing the incoming transfer RNAs from bringing in their amino acids, thus preventing the, the protein synthesis. Macrolides and chloramphenicol, on the other hand, are going to bind to the larger of the two subunits, the 50S subunit, and will prevent the formation of peptide bonds between the growing amino acid chain and the incoming amino acid. Like tetracyclines, both macrolides and chloramphenicols will stop protein synthesis. Where aminoglycosides causes mutations to the growing peptides, the effect is bactericidal. While the other three classes stop further proteins from being made, and this effect is felt as bacteriostatic. All four classes have broad spectrum activity on bacteria. The fifth mode of action is to prevent RNA replication. And the target in this case is RNA polymerase. The antibacterial agents that do this are known as rifamicins. They bind to the beta subunit of the initiating transcription complex and prevents the function of RNA polymerase. If RNA polymerase cannot transcribe messenger RNA from, from DNA, then further protein synthesis will also be prevented. The last mode of action is that of DNA replication, and the target here is DNA gyrase. Helicase is an enzyme that unwinds double-stranded DNA during DNA replication, which in effect will lead to supercoiling, as shown here on the right. In order for supercoiling to be, for the DNA to be relaxed, DNA gyrase needs to unwind the supercoils to allow helicase to continue to open up the double-stranded DNA and thus continue DNA replication. Eukaryotic cells have a molecule similar to DNA gyrase, it's called topoisomerase, but because they are different proteins, quinolones and fluoroquinolones specifically target DNA gyrase and prevents it from functioning. This covers the six modes of action that antibacterial agents use to kill or inhibit bacterial growth, and thus concludes this video.